So, after studying the surface tension and elasticity of lung, let us just go to the mechanism of spontaneous breathing, in other words, the mechanics of lungs and chest wall. Let us draw lungs in end expiratory phase, right, and see the working anatomy of the lungs. Now, we have already covered how intercostal muscles and diaphragm play a part in spontaneous ventilation. Now, in order to understand the working of lungs, you need to know about the pleura. There is a visceral pleura that is closely linked to the lungs, which I am drawing in navy blue. And let us give purple color to the parietal pleura that is close to the chest wall, right? Now, this is the parietal pleura. Now, the space you can see between these two pleurae is being marked with a sky blue color and this is the pleural cavity. Note that this pleural cavity is not as huge as is being depicted in the diagram for conceptual purposes. Like the other day I was doing this ultrasound of chest. Can you see the black arrowed sliding of the white lines onto each other? These are the two pleura. So you see the the gap between these two pleura is just a potential space, not as huge as is being drawn here. So, after discussing the working anatomy, let us just see the pressures. Now, there are three pressures that you need to know about in order to understand the working. One is the alveolar pressures. We know that at end expiration, the alveolar pressures reach zero, which is equal to the atmospheric pressure. So, the second is atmospheric pressure and the third is the intrapleural pressures. At sea level, the atmospheric pressure is 760 millimeters of mercury. The alveolar pressures at end expiration would be equal to atmospheric pressures, but the intrapleural pressures will always stay negative. So, let us say 756. Now, in terms of relative pressures, if we take uh, atmospheric pressure as reference point 0, the intrapleural pressure would be minus 5 centimeters of water. This is about end expiration that we are talking. So, why is this intrapleural pressure negative? It is because number 1, the recoils of chest outside and recoil of lung inside. As a result of these two opposing forces, the volume of the pleural cavity increases and as per Boyle's law, the pressure is inversely proportional to volume. So, when the volume increases, the pressure decreases. Let us say we have these five particles exerting pressure in a small box. Now, if I were to increase the volume of the box, but keep the five particles constant, th then the net exertion of pressure on the walls would reduce, right? So, same principle applies here in the intrapleural cavity. When the volume increases, the pressure decreases, thus leading to the sub-zero intrapleural pressures or minus 5. So, this is the reason that intrapleural pressures are in negative. So, we have covered that the atmospheric pressure is taken as 0, the intrapulmonary or alveolar pressure is taken 0 and the intrapleural pressure is minus 5. Note that this is right before the breath is taken. One more concept is about the flow, the flow of gases. Now, the flow is directly dependent on the pressure gradients, the flow of water through a mountain from height to lower point. Let us say P1 is the high point and P2 is the low point. In the same way, gases flow from higher pressures to the lower pressures, right? So, if we were to draw a lung, the atmosphere is P1 and the alveolar pressure is taken as P2, right? So, in order to generate flow, there has to be a difference between P1 and P2. If we increase the P1 as in positive pressure ventilation of ventilators, then the flow would be generated. That is called positive pressure ventilation. But in a spontaneously breathing lung, what happens is that the alveolar pressures become negative compared to the zero of atmosphere as a result of which the pressure gradient is created and the flow is generated from outwards to inwards into the alveoli. So, this change in pressure is the key to generating flow. What does that mean? That means that when there is no flow, it would mean that the alveolar pressures equate the atmospheric pressures. There is no pressure gradient then and when there is no pressure gradient, there is no flow, right? So, P1 minus P2 would be 0. This happens at the end of expiration and the end of inspiration, right? So, no flow means that the atmospheric pressure is equal to alveolar pressure. 
Another important concept in order to understand the lung mechanics is about the transmural pressures. So I have covered that in the subsequent video in a 5 minute uh, episode, the concept behind the transmural pressures. Now in terms of lungs, this transmural pressure is called the transpulmonary pressure, right? The mura means wall, so the lung wall, the pressures around the lung walls which direct whether the lung would expand or collapse, right? And this pressure is always the difference between the inner side and the outer side. In terms of lungs, it is the difference between the inner side, mainly the alveolar pressure and the outside, the intrapleural pressures. So that would dictate the transpulmonary pressure. Now remember, whatever the transmural pressure is, if it is positive, it will direct the wall from inside to outside. And if the sum is negative, then it would drive that wall from outside to inside. So the transpulmonary pressure would be 0 minus minus 5, which would make it a positive value of 5, meaning overall it would drive the lung from inside to outside, right? In terms of thoracic cage, the inner pressure would be intrapulmonary pressure and the outside would be atmosphere. Now if we calculate the equation, it would become minus 5. So the trans thoracic pressure is in negative value, which means that this would direct the thoracic wall cage inside from outside, right? So trans thoracic pressure is the transmural pressure defining the thoracic cage and trans pulmonary pressure is the transmural pressure which directs the lungs. Now this is a very important concept in order to understand the lung mechanics. So if you are still confused about it, you can see the next video in which we have clearly identified these two pressures and how they affect the wall. The points to remember here are intrapleural pressure is negative in nature. Number two, the flow is pressure dependent. No pressure difference means no flow. Boyle's law means volume is inversely proportional to pressures and this is the principle behind intrapleural pressure being negative and surfactant reduces the surface tension. So let's just breathe in the concepts for five seconds before going into the respiratory mechanics. So let's just start with the respiratory mechanics now. We know that at end expiration, the alveolar pressures are zero compared to the atmospheric pressure. Now remember that the atmospheric pressure would always stay zero, right, as reference point. It is the change in alveolar pressure that would generate flows. So when there is no flow, uh, the net pressure difference between alveolus and atmosphere is zero. The intrapleural pressure is minus five. We have studied before that diaphragm and the intercostal muscles are primarily responsible for initiating the inspiration. 75% contribution by diaphragm and 25% by the external intercostal muscle. As a result of which, the chest wall would move outwards and diaphragm would move downwards by 5 to 7 centimeters. So when the diaphragm moves downwards, it means that the intrapleural cavity volume would increase, right? So see, the intrapleural cavity volume has now increased. As per Boyle's law, the pressure would start to decrease from minus 5 to minus 8. And this would generate a pressure drop in alveoli from 0 to minus 1. So when there is pressure gradient between the eight atmospheric 0 and the alveolar pressure, flow would be generated from outside to inside. So this is how inspiration starts. Right? So let's fill the graphs as well as we move along. So what happens from start of inspiration, where is the end inspiratory point? Let's see that the lungs are fully inflated now, right? The volume of air going into the lungs would increase the pressure in the alveoli. Ultimately, it would reach zero again. So no flow because the pressure gradient would be zero again, right? So this is the end point of inspiration with no pressure difference from P1 to P2. So how does expiration takes place? We've heard that expiration is passive in nature. By passive, it means the elastic recoil of lungs takes action now. Now, we've already studied before that over distended alveoli 
would have surfactant in less concentration as a result of which the surface tension would increase and it would cause inward recoil along with the elastin fibers. So when the lungs are maximally inflated, it would lead to decreased compliance and increased elastins of the lungs. So this elastic recoil of the lungs would generate pressure on the alveolus and it would start to increase to positive values compared to the atmosphere and would generate flow in the opposite direction from the lungs to the outside. Right? So you see the flow is being generated from the lungs to the outside until of course it would return back to zero which is equal to the atmospheric pressure and no flow. So the question arises that where does the expiration end point occur? Well, in a normally breathing patient the end point would be at forced residual capacity which is the volume remaining in the lungs at normal expiration. This is the volume where the inward recoil of lung balances the outward recoil of chest. We will study it in detail in the subsequent chapters. But in strenuous exercise, the forceful expiration requires the abdominal musculature to come into effect. Its contraction would further push the diaphragm upwards and further constrict the lungs as a result of which the residual volume would be the last to remain. So normal expiration is passive in nature and is dependent on elastic recoil. The active inspiration requires abdominal musculature. This is all about lung mechanics. If you have any query, leave a comment in the comment box and we'll see you in the subsequent chapters. Thank you.